Okay. Uh, thanks for everybody coming out. Uh, the conference has been great so far. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about compilers and why I think they're at the core of the next evolution of web performance. Uh, before we get started, my name is Chad Itella. I'm a senior staff engineer at LinkedIn. We get to work on performance related things and a bunch of open source JavaScript infrastructure that help power uh, LinkedIn's applications. I'm also part of the EmberJS core team, as Jay mentioned, um, and I work on a bunch of different libraries and frameworks within that ecosystem. So if you have any questions about Ember or LinkedIn, come find me after my talk. But before we jump into my talk, we first have to get a baseline understanding of what is a compiler. And I think it's something that can be rather intimidating for people because it's, it's associated with things like computer science and theory and all that great stuff. Um, but I think the high level takeaway of what actually is a compiler is that it's really just a code translator. It's going to take some source code in, it's going to transform it in various ways, and what you're going to get out as output is another program that can be ran and executed. Um, so for example, a browser, you can write a super simple add one function like this, not too interesting. But what the browser is going to do is that it's going to parse and compile that into some lower level code and then execute it. And so things like JIT compilers inside of the browser have made the web a very viable platform in terms of building very sophisticated applications. But I'm not here to talk about those compilers. I am here to talk about the compilers that we use in our day-to-day -day work. Um, and We've actually been using compilers for some period of time, actually about 15 years. And so we're going to quickly take a look at what these compilers have given us over the years. So we first have to go back to 2003 when Douglas Crockford writes JSMin. It's a one file C library that just removes the meaningless white space from our JavaScript code. And it drastically shrinks the size of our JavaScript bundles that we're shipping over the wire. Uh, very quickly after that, YUI compressor comes out. Uh, it does kind of the same thing. It removes all the white space from our code, but it's the first time that we introduced the notion of mangling or symbol mangling. And symbol mangling goes something like this. You can have some JavaScript. This is like ES, valid ES3 code, because that's what you would have at the time. And what it does is it pulls out all of the uh, user-defined identifiers inside of the code. And what it's going to do is it's going to map them onto a set of new identifiers that are much smaller. And it, you, the way that it does this is that the compiler has all of this lexical and semantic information inside of it. And so it knows it can safely rewrite identifiers from one thing to the next. And so while this isn't new in 2018, uh, I think everybody that's building a production application is minifying their code. In 2003, this was a pretty big win uh, for applications. And then comes this period from uh, 2003 and 2008. And uh, not a whole lot happens. Because this is actually uh, the life and death of ES4. So for people who aren't familiar with ES4, it was a version of JavaScript that never really shipped. Um, but if you look back at the specification today, you will see a lot of things that ES4 was trying to ship. It had like a module system, it had classes, it had generators, it had iterators, it had destructuring assignment. All of the things that in a modern web application today you're probably doing. But they didn't ship. And a lot of engineers at that point in time were trying to build more sophisticated applications. Remind you, this is like when like Google Maps is coming out, and uh, we're kind of changing the face of the types of application that we're building for the web. So next comes this period from like 2008 to 2010, and what do we see? We see an explosion of compilers into this into our front end tool chains. Um, Specifically, I would like to call this period the Enlightenment. It is kind of the origin story that explains where, are, where we are from, the, from a tooling perspective. Um, it's the notion that we can you know, start introduce more and more compilers into our uh, tool chain. So specifically, uh, libraries like Cappuccino, GWT, and a new language, CoffeeScript, were all kind of like fed up with the fact that they didn't have specific language features inside of the browser. And so in the case of like Cappuccino, they built a language which was a dialect of Objective-C and it was known as Objective-J. And GWT used Java and CoffeeScript kind of took the best parts of uh, Python and Ruby and created a new language. The thing that they all have in common here is that they compiled to valid JavaScript that could run in the browser. So 
the big idea during this period of time is JavaScript is effectively a bytecode format. You don't actually have to write in JavaScript to be shipping, our, shipping these applications. We can write in a new language that we created or an existing language that created, and we just build a sophisticated compiler to produce uh, JavaScript that can run in the browser. And so this allowed you to like move away from runtime systems, like class systems that were in the browser, and just rely on a compiler to produce the correct code. The other big idea during this period of time was uh, more advanced minifiers. Uh, so this is a uh, closure compiler. Um, and closure compiler is pretty unique. Um, it came out right around the same time of GWT. Um, so if you have all of this code in the same lexical scope and you see that like predicate is never getting reassigned, so the, condition, the first conditional is always going to execute, the second conditional never going to actually be entered. Uh, then you have this do stuff function that is left and right and a callback that's never being used. Uh, it's kind of uh, bananas code here. Um, and the last line is just doing string, uh, fancy string, con uh, string concatenation. What Clojure Compiler can do is that it not only minifies the code, but it can produce more optimal code because it examines the whole breadth of your application and figures out at build time how it would run at runtime. And so what we would actually call Closure Compiler is that it is an optimizing compiler and it's meant to produce more optimal code bundles um, for your applications. And so that kind of leads us to where we are today from a tooling perspective. And today we have like really great tools. We have Webpack, we have Rollup, we have Babel, and we had like Tracer for some period of time, which is basically the same thing as Babel. And so you'd think today in 2018, we have reached like the pinnacle of performance on the web. We have all like these sophisticated tools and compilers that are like changing our code to make it more optimal. But, uh, well, actually they do this too. They, they're building off the backs of uh, things that came before it, like new language features, optimized bundles, dead code elimination, all that type of stuff. But I actually think that there's some problems in paradise. Um, and so there's this great tweet by Alex Russell, who is on the, the Chrome team. And what he says is that it doesn't matter how fast they make Chrome, developers abuse users with ever larger piles of JavaScript. And JavaScript is the most expensive thing. This is one of the more tamed down ones that I, I decided to include here. Um, so let me unpack this a little bit. Um, so I think over the course of the past five years, we've taken a pretty fundamental change. There's been a fundamental change in terms of what the role of JavaScript is in, our, in the applications that we build for the web. And we've put more and more emphasis on using JavaScript to do all types of things. And so this, the amount of JavaScript that we're shipping in the browsers is a lot. And the last thing what he's talking about is this. Uh, Jay touched on this a little bit. Um, it is the parse and compile of JavaScript. And it is quite expensive. So the Chrome team has put together this great article, this specifically Adi Asmani put this together. Um, and what it's talking about is the bytes of JavaScript are not the same bytes as a JPEG. So for example, you can pull 170 KB of Java across, JavaScript across the wire and 170 KB of a JPEG across the wire and it's gonna take about the same time. But once it gets onto the browser, it's like a whole nother game. Um, you have this textual representation of your code, which is a JavaScript, that needs to be parsed and compiled. And in this case, it's taking like two seconds to just do the parse and compile, and then an additional 1.5 seconds to actually execute it. Whereas the JPEG is just binary data, so it goes through a decoder of some sort, and then it, it is, those instructions are then painted to the screen. So very different, like orders of magnitude different in terms of uh, the bite size here and what, what you actually get out of it. So as I mentioned, um, I'm on the Ember JES core team and I've been working on this project for the past couple of years known as the Glimmer VM. And the Glimmer VM is actually the rendering engine inside of Ember and it's implemented as a virtual machine. And I'll get to what that means a little bit later. But for those who are familiar of how Ember works, it goes something like this. Uh, this is your uh, to-do MVC example. Uh, so basically, you're going to each over a bunch of to-dos in, array, in an, uh, an array. For each iteration of that loop, you're going to invoke an item component passing the to-do, and then you're going to close over an action, which is just a function that is going to toggle the state of the to-do. Um, and the item component is a, a template-only component, or what you, if you're familiar with React, it's a pure component. It just draws from its inputs. Um, and so that's not all too interesting. Uh, the backing class is, goes something like this for the to-dos component. It's just got their, our array and then our function. So this stuff 
isn't really too important, but I thought I'd kind of show what it looks like. But the one thing you will notice is that we actually use templates um, to basically lay out your view. And it's kind of, it's been that way since Ember broke off from Sprout Core uh, like seven years ago. Sprout Core was another framework that used JavaScript widgets to lay out the view. And so the idea was to add this declarative templating language to it. And we're not actually alone on, on this front. There's other libraries and frameworks out there like Vue and Angular that have taken the approach of using a declarative uh, templating language for you to describe uh, your views. But at the end of the day, what both Vue and Angular do is that they compile those templates into JavaScript, even though that you, they have a compiler stack and everything like that. They still target the JavaScript language. Well, the Glimmer VM actually compiles your templates into what is known as a binary executable, kind of like WebAssembly. Um, and so what does that actually mean? That means like you can write this you know, template and what we compile it to, into is a bunch of numbers, kind of like how Jay showed, um, that are encoding the instructions to recreate that template at runtime. And so you may be saying to yourself, wow, this is like super cool. What does this actually have to do with like parse and compile? Well, binary data is actually represented in the browser as a typed array. Um, and so this is a definition from uh, the documentation. So what it says is that a typed array is a slab of memory with a typed view into it, much like how arrays work in C. Because typed arrays is blocked back by raw memory, the JavaScript engine can pass it, that memory directly to native libraries without having to painstakingly convert the data into a native representation. So the TLDR of that is that it never actually sees the parse and compile pipeline of JavaScript because it is effectively seen as raw memory. So with those specific properties, if we look at actual applications in the wild, and these are all open source Ember applications, what we find is anywhere from 25 to 40% of these applications are templates. And so if we can move this code, which would otherwise be compiled to JavaScript into something that isn't JavaScript, then we can reduce, and part, reduce the parsing compile of applications altogether. So no JavaScript uh, talk that's talking about performance wouldn't be complete without an extremely contrived example. Um, so what we did was to kind of like test this hypothesis of can we actually reduce the parse and compile time of these things was that we built three applications. Each application is 50 Wikipedia articles. Each article is a component. And we did that in React, Preact, and, and then Glimmer. So with React and Preact, you get something that looks like this. And I guess I should preface it this. This was with a 5x CPU slowdown. And we used like, the Chrome debugging protocol to launch these things in isolation and collect the telemetry on them. Um, so those are the results of that. And what we did find was that the Glimmer stuff was actually quite lower. Uh, you can actually try all these things out and benchmark them yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, this is an extremely contrived example. This, however, was not. Um, so I work at LinkedIn, and last year we actually built the LinkedIn feed twice, one in Preact and one in Glimmer, um, and with the, the binary template format. While we think that Preact and uh, Glimmer are great libraries for building very fast web, web applications, the Glimmer one ended up being slightly faster, and you can read more about that experiment there. That was like nine months of building these two apps and running it for the experiment for a week and a half and then basically throwing it away to, once we collected the results. Um, so how do we actually do this? How do we take this textual representation of like your declared views and convert it into a binary format? Well, we're gonna start with something super simple. So when you write uh, a Glimmer template is actually HTML. Um, so we're gonna go with this because it's, it, it's quicker to explain. Um, so the first thing that we do is that we are going to tokenize that template into an abstract syntax tree. That abstract syntax tree is going to get transformed in multiple different ways. We're basically compiling at different layers. But what we get out of it at the end is a linear set of statements. Um, and they're very declarative in terms of what they're actually doing. We're going to open an element h1. We're going to, we have some text. It's a hello chat. And then we close the element. So this is JSON. This isn't actually the binary format. So what we actually have to do is compile it further um, in, using what is known as opcode compiler. Jay talked a little bit about what an opcode is. Um, this is kind of just reemphasizing it. The opcode, you can kind of think of it as like a very special number in the VM that 
is going to perform some level of work and then it takes uh, a number of operands in this case, and the Glimmer VM it can take up to three uh, operands, that's how big an instruction can actually be. And so this is what we're gonna compile into this linear set of uh, instructions on how to recreate that template. So going back to our JSON format, what we're gonna do is just kind of go through this list of things. So we would pop the first statement off, um, take the first element in that array and map it into a method uh, of the same name. So in this case, open element maps onto the open element me method. It's gonna take um, the operands, the, the H1 in this case, as the first argument there, and then we push it into what is known as a constants pool, um, specifically the string constants pool. And it's just an, uh, an array of, that's gonna hold all of the user-defined literals in the system. And what we get out of that is a number, so in this case, zero, it's gonna be the first item in the string constants pool, and we pass zero into this dot builder open element. And so what the builder is actually doing is that it's just holding on to these significant numbers, so we can basically have an abstraction around it, so we're not just passing numbers all over the place. The builder just encapsulates the numbers. And so in doing so, what gets created is this array of numbers and then a bunch of literals inside of this uh, object here. And that's basically it. That's how we compile the template. It's just more or less mapping things into uh, these numbers that are meaningful to the VM. So once we've done that, uh, the thing we have to do in the browser is actually execute it. Um, the first thing we have to do, though, is fetch the binary data. Uh, so we use fetch to do, to do this, and we get the response back, and we ask for it as an array buffer, um, which means it's gonna be the binary data, and then we pass that, that buffer into the UN16 array, and then that's gonna go into our virtual machine. So, uh, this is kind of my visualization of like how the virtual machine works. Um, virtual machine, our virtual machine just is kind of like any other virtual machine in that it keeps on executing. Uh, in our case, we like have a, we have an iterator type of pattern and we're gonna keep on calling next until we have basically gotten to the end of instructions. And so we have the executable at the top, we have the constants pool, um, the second line, we have registers which are more or less keeping track of the state. So constructing is gonna hold on to an HTML uh, element as we're constructing it. The PC is known as the program counter. It's just keeping track of where we're at in the actual executable. Return address um, is used if we were doing things like invoking components. It tells you where in the program you need to jump back to once we've done you know, invoking that component. In this case, it's gonna stay negative one. Um, and then we have stacks. So we have an execution stack and we have an element stack. For this uh, presentation, we only actually need the element stack. And so we're gonna walk through of like what it looks like to actually execute this code. So the first thing that we do is open element. Open element is represented as 31 uh, in the system and it has an operand zero. Zero says just look inside the concepts pool and give me the H1 out. Um, it constructs the element, it places it onto the constructing register, and that's all it does. Next is 38. If we actually had attributes and everything like that, there would have been more instructions in front of this thing, but because there's no attributes, we just immediately flush the element from the constructing register onto the element stack, and we move along. Next uh, is text. Text, all it's gonna do is pop the element off the element stack, append the text node, and push it back on. Um, in this case, you can see that it's dereferencing one out of the, the constants pool to get its value. Uh, the last thing that we do is close element. Close element just flushes the element stack and appends the, the DOM node, and you would get hello Chad in, in the browser. And finally, uh, we're done executing, we get a return. Return sets the return address to the program counter. In this case, it was always negative one, and this tells the VM to stop executing. So that's kind of it. That's kind of how the Glimmer VM works. So we th really think about handlebars as a programming language for uh, creating these types of applications. And the Glimmer VM is just the runtime and the bytecode format uh, for creating DOM. It's, I think, pretty cool. So Jay uh, talked about WebAssembly, 
And we're really excited about WebAssembly because we feel that it's very closely aligned in terms of where we're going uh, with uh, the Glimmer VM and where things are headed in terms of the web in general. And so <clears throat> while Jade did mention that a lot of the you know, movement right now is in the space of like C and C++ or writing in Rust, but I really think that one of the things that we can take advantage of is converting the DSLs that we have today, the domain-specific languages that other libraries use, like templating languages and all of those uh, languages that are, have some type of compiler associated with them, and compiling either to WebAssembly or the runtime in which they run in is written in WebAssembly. And so we actually worked with the Rust and the Mozilla team to figure out how we could leverage WebAssembly inside of the Glimmer VM. And so these are all parts of the Glimmer VM. They're the, you know, the constructs in it. And what we found was that the, all this stuff kind of at the bottom is really talking about the VM and things that you would typically want a systems level language to manage. So it's like managing pointers, it's managing uh, positions in heap, it's you know, pushing and popping things from stack, it's dealing with a lot of like number churning and everything like that. And so what we did was that we rewrote those uh, pieces in Rust um, and then compiled them to WebAssembly. And so because of the way that the system is architected, the end developer or the person that's actually writing these templates doesn't even know about this detail that we have uh, kind of slotted in underneath you. Um, just all of a sudden, uh, you can take advantage of WebAssembly and you didn't have to write in uh, you know, a systems language to do so. Um, and so this is real. Uh, you can try this out. This is an application that is using the Glimmer VM with a WebAssembly, uh, the parts kind of converted to it. And you can like go in Firefox or Google Chrome and see all of the WebAssembly code. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, this is still ver very early on, like Jay had mentioned. There's a lot of, uh, we have to go back and forth across this bridge many times. Uh, and so it's not as performant as we'd like it to be, but we thought you know, it'd be a cool experiment to kind of work on. So those are all the ways that we're really thinking about parsing compile. It's a really hard problem to solve because it's not one that you see very early on in your application. It's one that kind of slowly creeps up on you. And as you add more and more uh, features to your application, you're incurring the cost of parse and compile, especially if you're putting a lot of more JavaScript into your application. So hopefully uh, today I showed that we actually do have the technology to do uh, different things besides uh, just leveraging JavaScript for everything. All we really do need is more sophisticated compilers and more and, and different ways of thinking about the problems. So, thanks. I went to a lot of computer science college, and where like I had to like write compilers just for like fun and grades and stuff, and then I became a web developer, and I was like, I don't need to worry about compilers because like. I don't need to worry about garbage collection. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm hearing like I do, and it's like, what? Like, I'm like that Mr. Crab meme where everything's <laughs> a blur all around me. Um, but then when you think about it, a lot of us who are, are building for the web right now, we're already using compilers, right. like Babel, for yep. example. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Babel specifically because it's such a big part of what a lot of people are building in JavaScript. and. Um, it is now an independent project and can use support, and they're on Open Collective. So I think that we use a lot of different modules and frameworks and stuff, and they're like sort of out of sight, out of mind, and we forget that there are people behind them building them and allowing us to build cutting edge technology mm -hmm. that can still be used by people using the web in like a library on an old right. computer. Um, so I think it's important for everyone to look at what you're building with and like support it. Um, what, what got you into building a compiler? Uh, so I do not have a CS background. I have a background in finance. Um, so uh, I just think that the problem was kind of, we, so I work at LinkedIn and we had seen very big problems with compiling the templates that we had before to JavaScript. It was like this huge part of our code base is when we were shipping it over to our users, it ended up being like 40% of like the code that we were shipping over. So we were like, 
we need to find a more efficient way of representing these templates. Um, and so that was kind of the necessity is that it was just too big. And so we had to figure out what was a more optimal way of um, sending the same exact code, but changing the compilation target out underneath it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn and how they've become sort of a steward of, of open source, especially around the Ember project. Yeah. Um, how has it been working on open source as part of your job? Because, right, is that right. It's a yeah. part of it? Yeah, a lot of it. So for some context, I was like one of the people that helped bring like Ember to LinkedIn. So I've been basically doing it the, the longest uh, at LinkedIn and trying to really build a culture around like giving back to like these projects. I personally really like it. I get to work on a bunch of interesting things and you know, give back to a lot of other projects that are in the ecosystem that we integrate with it and inside of Ember and stuff like that, yeah. What led to the decision to pull Glimmer out of Ember? Um, so, there's a couple uh, things. Uh, so we had a, another rendering engine. It was known as HTML bars. Uh, we tried building some of these more um, performant component systems on top of it. So uh, we, so it came out right around the same time that React came out and like kind of introduced this model of rendering, which is like I just set the state and then it re-renders the world. And then we tried modeling those types of semantics on top of the old rendering engine. And while we could do it is it took a pretty big performance hit. And so we're like, oh, well, we kind of have to re-architect everything uh, because this is obviously like this model is like very good. And I think that's like one of React's big takeaways is the programming model. And so we decided to break out, uh, fork off, HTML bars and create this Glimmer VM thing as a side project. Um, at the same time, we have to make it flexible enough so that you can use it, just plug it into Ember, but we wanted it as a standalone thing because we re realized that not everybody's building like these huge like single page applications and we want people to be able to write these small components and just kind of like plop them on different parts of the page and uh, the Glimmer VM offers the ability to do both. Cool. I'm very, um, I'm very into compilers, non-jokingly, um, glitches built in CopyScript. And right. um, I, I strongly feel that um, when someone makes a, like a compiler transpiling language, it helps push forward the innovation of the right. language that you're compiling to. Yep. And I think that is really what has helped uh, the popularity of JavaScript grow. Right. And again, I'm very excited about WebAssembly and, yeah. and you know all that sort of stuff. Um, but thank you for uh, telling us the work that you're doing and giving that uh, history. Yeah. Thank you very much. Round of applause for Chad. Okay.